So good morning, everyone. I want to start uh, this morning with a quick update on the census. I'm pleased to report, while we previously lagged behind the rest of the country, we're now fifth in the rankings and on track to match our 2010 response. But we can do even better. So if you haven't completed your census forms, go to my2020census.gov to complete it. And I thank those who have already done so. It really does make a difference for our state. As a reminder, uh, Fridays will now be dedicated to education updates. And Secretary French is here to reflect on the first three weeks of school restart and more on moving to step three. And as many of you know, about a month ago, we began an effort to create a system of childcare hubs to help support families on remote working days due to the different hybrid approaches schools were taking. Since then, the Agency of Human Services in partnership with Vermont After School has worked quickly to stand up these hubs. I'm pleased to have Holly Morehouse here today, the Executive Director of Vermont After School, uh, to provide an update on this work. Holly, along with her staff and the Department of Ch Children and Families, have worked with communities across Vermont to expand and create quality childcare hubs. And this work has been essential to help families during this unusual school year. This has been a great example of collaboration amongst many partners. Holly will share more in a few minutes on how it has worked and where it is today. But before I turn it over to Holly and Secretary French, uh, I want to take some time to remind folks of why we're doing this and the role we all need to play. Giving kids a good foundation has been a priority of mine as governor. Because as a former contractor, I know the stronger the foundation, the better the chance of a long-lasting positive outcome later in life. This is why I prioritize investments in childcare throughout my times as governor. It's also why I put an emphasis on in-person instruction, especially for younger students, while our low case counts will support it. We need to do all we can to give our kids the best possible education, even during these uncertain and challenging times. I greatly appreciate the work of school administrators, teachers, and support staff across the state, as well as my team at the Agency of Education for helping get these kids back to school this fall. And a special thank you to our child care partners for supporting remote learning needs. And with a few weeks under our belt, all indications are their work is paying off. But here's what's so important for the rest of us to remember. Their success and our ability to maintain and expand in-person learning for our kids depends on all of us doing what we need to do to keep the level of virus low in our communities. Vermont has had a lot of success, and we've gotten a lot of attention for that success. But we cannot get lulled into complacency. Like Dr. Fauci told us, we can't let our guard down. While our region continues to do better than many other parts of the country, if you look at some of the larger outbreaks in surrounding states like Maine, their health officials are warning that the quick spread appears to be the result of folks not following the, sa the state's safety protocols. We can't let that happen here. There will always be risk of spread but the procedures we have in place for businesses, schools, and more, as well as the basic individual steps we've all been taking, have, uh, will limit this risk. But we all have to do our part to follow them. That means wear a mask around others, keep physically distanced, wash your hands, stay home when sick, and follow the travel and other health guidance. It's more important than ever that we keep this up for our kids, and families as well as for our communities and our economy. If we stay vigilant and continue to suppress this virus, we'll continue taking steps forward, not back, and we'll get through this stronger than we were before. I'll now turn it over to Holly for more of uh, on our child care hubs. Holly?
Thank you, Governor. And thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I am Holly Morehouse, Executive Director of Vermont After School. We are a statewide nonprofit dedicated to ensuring access to quality after school, summer, and expanded learning programs so that all of Vermont's children and youth can have the opportunities that they need and deserve to be active, engaged, connected, and heard. I'm grateful to be here this morning as just one member of an incredible team that has been working on this HEP effort, both at the Department for Children and Families and at Vermont After School. I'm also proud to represent what is truly an amazing field, those who work with children and youth outside the school day and over the summer. We all know that these are extraordinary times, and the directors and staff from the after school programs, the parks and recreation departments, the child care centers, and the youth serving organizations who have stepped forward to respond to this hub's challenge make up what is truly an extraordinary field. To understand the hub project, we have to go back to August when it became clear that not all of our elementary schools were going to be able to open for in-person classes as they would have in a normal year. And yet we knew that after months of being out of school, children needed access to programming and opportunities to play, connect, and learn with others in safe and caring spaces. We also knew that parents and family members needed to be able to return to work. I so appreciate Governor Scott for recognizing these needs, both of the school-aged children and of working families. And I appreciate Secretary Smith and the Department for Children and Families, particularly Miranda Gray, the state lead at DCF for the Hub Project, for stepping in to develop the Hub Initiative and to take this on. It's truly been a collaborative effort at the state level. For example, the Child Development Division and the Licensing Unit have worked closely with every Hub applicant to provide ongoing support and to make sure that every proposed location is appropriate for the care of children. The Division of Fire Safety has been ensuring that building, buildings are safe for children. The Agency of Natural Resources has been ensuring that children have access to safe drinking water and that septic systems are able to manage the increased usage. The Department of Labor has stepped in to assist with the staff recruitment process. The Agency of Education and Hunger Free Vermont have helped connect hubs to appropriate food programs so that children can have access to healthy snacks and meals. And the Department of Health has provided detailed health and safety guidelines. And they have answered countless questions from hub providers about facial coverings, keeping children in pods and cohorts, and more. And Let's Grow Kids and members of the Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance have helped to make sure that any system we set up for the hubs doesn't do harm to the existing network of child care providers. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the map behind me. I'm proud to report that in just over four weeks, we have established 35 hubs in 87 locations. The black squares on the map show the location of the hubs. The gray dots are the affiliated locations and sites that may belong uh, to a hub. So hubs can serve at children at more than one location. The shading of the map refers to the underlying school schedules. The green areas have returned um, to in-person classes five days a week for elementary students, and the yellow and red areas cover areas where schools have a hybrid model or are fully remote. An interactive version of this map is available on our website at vermontafterschool.org under the COVID-19 section. I invite all of you to go to the website. You can toggle on any of those locations. You can click on the dots, uh, find out the street address, the name of the entity, contact information, uh, the grades of the children that they serve. And when you dig deeper into the data, you will see that the current network of hubs can serve over 5,000 children from approximately 107 towns in Vermont and 132 schools. I'd like to also point out that behind every one of these dots is a local story of innovation, determination, flexibility, and caring in Vermont's communities. This has by no means been an easy process, but we have learned so much. We have learned that where there was an existing after-school provider or out-of-school time program, it was often easier as well as less expensive to get a school-age hub up and running. These hubs didn't magically appear out of thin air. In order to get the new system in place, we worked with many existing partners on the ground and in communities 
who already knew how to work with children and youth and how to run these programs and who had existing relationships both with schools and with families. In many cases, these are the after-school programs and youth organizations that pivoted back in March to providing childcare for essential workers, to creating virtual learning spaces for children and youth, to helping distribute school meals while kids were at home, and to running safe and engaging summer programs these past few months. We have also learned that where there is close collaboration between the school leadership teams and the after-school program or hub provider, the services and support for families tend to be better coordinated and often more affordable. We've seen innovative partnerships at the local level to help fill in the gaps based on community need. Whether it's the owner of a fitness center providing space for a program, a business working with a hub provider to create a cohort for the children of their employees, or a local church opening their doors for use by a nearby program. We also quickly saw that the work is about so much more than just opening a location. It's about recruiting staff, providing training, figuring out complex schedules, thinking through so many aspects of health and safety. Vermont After School has been providing technical assistance for all of the hub sites. We created an extensive staffing campaign to find qualified individuals, and we are providing several weeks of free virtual training for hub staff on a wide range of topics from child development to youth voice, to social emotional learning and family engagement. We have also seen very clearly that the funding for school aged childcare and youth serving programs can vary greatly from one location to the next. While we did put a number of measures in place to help families, we don't yet have a system in Vermont that fully addresses the underlying inequities and access to childcare and supports for children and youth outside the school day. However, COVID has taught us so much about how important these programs and resources are for Vermont's families, businesses, schools, and communities. So what do these hubs look like? What do they look like on the ground? Well, I can tell you they are full of joy, flexibility, and creativity. Staff are supporting learning, working in facial coverings all day, finding ways to get children outside as much as possible, and playing that crucial role between home and school. There's so much positive child development that comes from playing with peers, having caring adults who can focus on social emotional growth, participating in hands-on learning activities, being physically active outdoors, trying new hobbies, and exploring new interests from birding to engineering to building forts in the woods to pottery. Hubs are also integrating time every day for children to participate in remote learning activities provided by their schools. They have created quiet spaces, provided access to Wi-Fi, set up crayons and markers and space to complete assignments, and staff are there to offer an encouraging word and to help children stay on task. All this while maintaining health, me health measures to keep kids and staff safe. What's left to do? Well, the work is not done. The landscape around school schedules will continue to evolve. This map will continue to change as we move through the fall. We'll continue to track the child care needs of families and respond as best we can. As schools transition to additional in-person days for students, we will continue to work with the hubs to figure out how best to support families and just hours accordingly. We are talking with the existing hubs now about what it will look like for them to be ready to reopen later if needed. Uh, we heard from 30 of the hubs this week in a survey that every single one of them said that they expected to most definitely or most likely be able to reopen later in the fall if they need to. At the same time, we're working with DCF to be prepared to meet the needs of schools, of, of schools that are currently in the classroom five days a week do have to shift and go to remote learning at any time in the future. The adaptability and problem solving approach we have seen thus far from the hubs will continue to be an asset moving forward. In closing, I'd like to thank Governor Scott and Secretary Smith for the opportunity to be part of this important initiative designed to respond to the challenge before us regarding children's needs and working families. The approach that Vermont has taken can also, in so many ways, strengthen the overall system. By working with existing providers and local communities, by focusing on partnership and collaboration, by expanding sites and staff in thoughtful ways, by running a staff recruitment campaign that brings new people into the field rather than drawing staff away from existing child care providers, these are all part of the story about how Vermont approached this current challenge while also making an investment for the future. I look forward to hearing your questions. I look forward to having deeper conversations about this important issue. And I look forward to having an even stronger system in Vermont. Thank you.
I, um, at this time, it is my um, uh, pleasure and uh, responsibility to turn uh, the virtual mic over to Secretary uh, Dan French. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Holly and Ramona, for school of your work. Uh, it's been very successful partnerships with our schools and just amazing how, how quickly and responsive it's been overall. I really appreciate it. Um, I thought I'd provide a few updates uh, since Tuesday's press conference. As you know, um, our schools will be moving to step three in our health guidance starting tomorrow, September 26. We opened our schools under step two with the more restrictive requirements to give our schools the opportunity to practice and become more comfortable implementing these stricter measures. Since conditions remain positive and our schools have demonstrated their ability to successfully operate with the measures in place, we decided to move to step three. Step three still requires schools to implement the basic mitigation strategies that have proven to be effective against the virus. Under step three, however, schools have some additional flexibility in how to implement these strategies in the two areas. For example, uh, one of those areas is school cafeterias. Under step two, schools are not allowed to use cafeteria spaces for feeding students. Under step three, on the other hand, schools may use their cafeterias for feeding students, with precautions being implemented, such as smaller group sizes and disinfecting regularly between groups. This flexibility is important since schools use their cafeterias in different ways, and not all schools have cafeterias. For example, Many of our smaller schools have multi-purpose rooms, or NPRs, that function as both cafeterias and gyms, and in some cases, also as auditoriums. The key aspect of the Step 3 guidance in this area is the word may. Under Step 3, schools are not required to start feeding students in their cafeterias. They may do so, but the decision is up to them. If they decide to do so, however, they need to follow the additional precautions necessary to ensure the safety of students and staff. Our schools have become used to interpreting these nuances in our guidance. Our guidance often includes both requirements and then for just recommendations. <clears throat> when schools operationalize our guidance and questions around implementation come up, we usually publish clarification to our guidance in the form of frequently asked questions or what we call FAQ documents. This week, we publish an FAQ on the differences between step two and step three. One area we address in this FAQ is the relationship between step three and in-person instruction. Moving to step three does not require districts to move to more in-person instruction, but we are encouraging them to do so, particularly for our youngest students, while the conditions remain positive. It's important to note that many districts, however, were already moving to additional in-person instruction so prior to the move to step three, and this move had been planned consistent with their reopening plans. For example, a superintendent of Essex Westford School District shared with me this week that their district is moving to in-person instruction for students in grades pre-K to five for five days a week starting October 5th. We expect more districts to increase their days of in-person instruction in the coming weeks. Another area I want to provide an update on has to do with our debriefing process around Crossing Brook school cases that happened a few weeks ago. Uh, we organized the debriefing process to further refine our ability to support schools uh, when positive cases emerge. The debriefing process started last Friday when members of the health department's contact tracing team and Dr. Kelso met with the leadership team of the school district. Uh, I then met with Dr. Kelso and the district superintendent on Tuesday, and we will be taking feedback from these meetings to refine our processes and to share our lessons learned with all school districts in the state. Two areas uh, that have emerged from these meetings. Uh, one has to do with improving uh, school uh, composition of the initial data exports uh, that go to the Department of Health relative to school contacts uh, so that we can ensure a rapid identification of contacts, particularly the close contacts, as soon as possible. Uh, we also think uh, districts would have benefit from additional state level communications on the contact tracing process uh, so they can better share that information with their communities. Also this week, um, our leadership team of the Department of Health met to review um, our state level health guidance. Uh, we have, as many of you know, a state level task force that was formed to help design this guidance. Uh, that task force comprised of medical experts and educational leaders from all the major educational associations. Uh, we decided this week that we're going to uh, reconvene that task force and it'll start meeting in the coming weeks to address possible revisions to the guidance. 
it was our intention to revisit our guidance on a monthly basis. Um, and we've identified a few areas that we think warrant revisions. Uh, one area that needs to be addressed is the colder weather that we've seen in the last few weeks and its impact on our ability to do uh, the daily health check process. The colder weather has made it uh, difficult to obtain accurate temperature checks for students and staff. And the temperature checks are required as part of our daily health check process. Um, I expect the task force uh, will address this concern and a few others we put together and uh, we'll be publishing an update for your guidance later uh, in, in October. Speaking of the colder weather, uh, the issue of snow days has come up a few times. Um, we subsequently have issued guidance for what we call climate weather days, such as snow days. Uh, basically, districts will not have to make up snow days during this emergency as long as they can satisfy the attendance requirements for remote learning uh, during those days. Uh, lastly, uh, we have started conversations with our various stakeholder groups to plan for the rest of the school year. Uh, so much of the work to date has been focused on reopening our schools and implementing the necessary precautions to ensure the safety of students and staff. Uh, much of this work has been logistical uh, to address operational areas such as instructional schedules, modifications to facilities, and communications planning. Um, we know we must continue this work uh, to ensure schools can operate safely and what will be no doubt changing conditions in the months ahead. At the same time, however, uh, we're anxious to restart the work of our education system to address the learning needs of our students. This will require us to begin to address the impact of the emergency and to design intervention strategies to address the educational needs of students. We hope to outline these strategies in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you, and I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before I get to my comments, I feel compelled to reinforce the governor's comments regarding Dr. Fauci's admonition to us to make sure that we don't let our guard down and put that into context as to why that is important, building on some of the comments we just heard. We've had great success in the K through 12 endeavors thus far. And minimal number of cases in our schools. Our child care experience has been phenomenal in the long term and in the recent term. That's because there are not cases being brought into those settings. Those settings are just microcosms of our greater community. So if the students who have parents are attending the school, if the workers in the child care settings are coming to work every day. They represent the level of virus that's in our community at large. The fact that we have a low level of virus is testimony to everyone's being receptive to and sticking to all of the guidance we give about how to live our daily lives. But that's so critical, and it's been the ingredient of our success. So we need to take Dr. Fauci's words seriously and continue that. Whether it's school, whether it's college, where we tested everybody, found some cases um, at the initial testing, but then basically uh, have fared quite well since that time um, because the college students are now part of our greater community. Our long-term care facilities, nursing homes, our correctional facilities, this is testimony to the fact that those who are working in those facilities are actually abiding by all of the guidance we've provided. So I just wanted to contextualize that a little bit and again reinforce the message you've been getting from us all. In terms of data, I don't have a lot to share on the data front today. Unfortunately, as a country, we've just passed two milestones, seven million cases. 200,000 deaths. Over the past week in Vermont, we've had very low case counts each day this entire week, which of course is great news. No additional cases to tell you about in the K through 12. Only one additional college case uh, was announced by the college yesterday at St. Mike's and I'd like to congratulate them on the promptness with which they reformed their university community. And, uh, and conferring with uh, our experts at the health department as well. 
We now, I believe, are at 1,781 cases. We're on the uh, 59th day without any deaths. We've had a total of 58 deaths. What I really want to talk to you about this morning, though, is the flu. We say every year the best way to prevent the flu, obviously, is to get a flu shot. It helps you avoid missing work or missing school or even having to go to the doctor, for that matter. And if you do get the flu, it can reduce the severity of the illness that you're going to have. It can be a lifesaver if you have underlying severe illnesses and are at higher risk because it can help prevent the related hospitalizations and occasionally deaths that might occur from the flu. And that's just the flu kind of in normal times. But during the current pandemic, there are a lot more unknowns. We don't know how common it might be to actually get the flu and COVID at the same time, or if having the flu makes you more susceptible to getting COVID thereafter. I think we'd all agree we don't really want to get both. We also don't know whether a surge in cases of COVID and the flu could happen at the same time, the so-called twindemic that could realistically overwhelm anybody's healthcare system and put people at risk. Simply put, we know more about the flu than we do about COVID, and we already have a vaccine to prevent it. <clears throat> so please get your flu shot and make sure your children do too Anyone over six months old, with rare exceptions, should be vaccinated. And certainly be vaccinated if you're in a high risk group or have underlying health conditions. Now this year, my team at the health department has ordered more flu vaccine than usual to prepare for the increased demand. So no matter what your age, six months to over 65, you have access to plenty of vaccine. And we're working closely with the entire medical community, primary care providers, visiting nurse associations, and we're encouraging community partnerships to provide clinics where access might be limited, like in schools, community centers, or assisted living facilities. I've mentioned we have a lot of innovative ways we thought about this year, and I'm really excited to hear about some of the innovative practices uh, that are already beginning to uh, happen out there uh, amongst medical practices, hospital groups, etc. They're finding ways to deliver the vaccine, some of which has been informed by COVID and others of which is just great creativity. Whoever thought you would drive through to get your vaccine, like a drive-through test in the COVID era, there are now opportunities to do that in the drive through fashion. You can go to a food pickup site and get a flu shot. There are mobile vans for people who have difficulty accessing some of the other sites that can bring the flu shot to you. Some of our colleagues in the healthcare system are partnering with schools to provide flu vaccine to both the students and the staff. All of this work makes the job of getting a flu shot much easier, much more accessible for Vermonters, and that can make a huge difference. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's not a lot of excuses you'll be able to come up with during the month of October, especially, for why you shouldn't be getting your flu shot or why it's a challenge to get one. You can still get it through your doctor's office or your local pharmacy or a clinic near you. And if you happen to not have insurance, you can depend on our local health offices, which are distributed throughout the state, and we will provide you with a free flu shot. If you want to learn more about this, healthvermont.gov slash flu. And of course, I have to end by saying to keep up those actions that have helped Vermonters spread, control the spread of COVID-19. They're going to help no matter what season we're in, COVID season, flu season, you name it. 
Meanwhile, we're also preparing for the eventuality of a safe and effective vaccine for COVID-19. I can't predict and won't predict exactly when that time will be, but I have great confidence that in Vermont, we will be ready for the vaccine before the vaccine is ready for use. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you very much, Dr. Levine, Secretary French, Holly. Uh, we'll now open up for questions. Calvin. All right, uh, thank you, Governor. I mean, you already Secretary Smith. So um, some schools are already going back to full in-person um, operations. I'm wondering at what point that we'll have to start closing down some of these hubs. Will we in for there yet, or uh, what, what that will look like? Yeah, I think that's either, I think it's a question for Holly, actually. Yes, thank you for your question. So we're already working with the hub sites on how that transition could move forward. Um, many of them are saying that they won't um, just disappear into thin air. What they'll do is they'll transition back to after school programming in the afternoons. They're shifting staff into um, additional positions um, and they are trying to be ready to reopen again later if they need to and we're really following closely both the landscape around COVID as well as what the schools are going to do in each of the communities. And then, uh, next question I think is just for probably Secretary Curley if she's on the phone. Um, about a month ago the state sent out checks for health care employers and public safety employers with the hazard rate. Grants. We're hearing from some employers that uh, they haven't gotten those, those checks yet. I'm wondering where we are with that process, with the first one. Yeah, I actually think that's in uh, Secretary Smith's um, oh. shop. Sure. Actually, on a hazard pay, I'm a little surprised with the question because um, we had a $28 million hazard pay program uh, as of today, and this was a few days ago, so just I think it's probably more. Uh, 20.1 million has already been distributed out there. Um, we expect to get an additional 4.9 million out the door. Um, it probably has already left Calvin out the door, uh, given that this is a few days old, to 25 million, and we're looking over the rest of the applications. As you know, legislature has expanded the hazardous pay program, so we'll be back um, probably doing more here in the near future in terms of the hazardous pay program. Why I've got the sort of the podium, let me just also talk about the healthcare stabilization program. Um, as you re remember, that uh, that program uh, was 275 million. We're we're distributing in the first round. It's in different tranches, different rounds that will do the the uh, distribution. The first round is about 100 million dollars. 80 of which were pretty much out the door now. Uh, 20 of which we had to go back and ask additional questions. As you know, the these are for uh, pretty complicated formulas for that particular program. So a lot has gone out the door in, uh, in these programs and more is to come. There's a second round of the healthcare stabilization as well that will begin in October. And then one last question while I have you. Um, you might have seen there was a letter that went out from UVM Health Network CEO John Brunston earlier this week to the Greenhouse Care Board basically pushing back on their their budget decision um, for the health network. I'm wondering if, if you've seen the letter and maybe uh, if you share any of the same concerns. I have seen the letter. I haven't read it carefully. I want to stay out of their fight between the Green Mountain Care Board and uh, the, the hospital. That's, you know, in terms of the Agency of Human Services, that um, we're, we're sort of on the periphery of that. Uh, that is uh, budget, uh, budget uh, sort of um, reviews that happen at the Green Mountain Care Board. I think what we've all got it do here, whether it's the Green Mountain Care Board or the, the, the network itself, UVM Health Network, is to try to find some common ground here as we move forward and make sure that we have stability in our system 
as well as um, uh, you know keeping costs down. Look, um, Vermonters understand that healthcare costs um, are a burden. They see that every every year, and and I think there's a line here that we really have got to uh, toe that make sure that we have stability in our system as well as making sure that we really pay attention to the needs of Vermonters out there. I, if I could just uh, go back to, um, to Holly uh, and the um, after school program. Uh, as you might recall as well, uh, my budget address and uh, state of the state I talked about as well as early care and learning the after school program and uh, developing and enhancing that. So this really does uh, put us a step closer uh, to that vision and uh, I think it's going to be essential in the future. Um, this question is either for your new governor or Dr. Levine. Um, Dr. Levine said, get your flu shot this now. You know, the twin demic we're hearing about. Right. Last month, Massachusetts announced they're requiring all students to be vaccinated from K through college. Has there been any discussion about that in regards to vaccinating all students here in the state for the flu? And if you don't see the number of flu shots in the state, is that something that's possible? I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Thanks for that question. I will uh, preface my comment by saying that Massachusetts, I believe, still is the only state to have done that. Um, so I say that only because they may be a major trendsetter or they may be uh, an exception. Uh, one can look at it either way. To answer your question, we have uh, had a very engaging discussion on this very topic um, and received lots of unsolicited communications from uh, many Vermonters on this topic. Uh, at this point in time, we don't feel that um, mandating the vaccine for the entire population is appropriate. I don't think you could mandate it for just school-aged children and, and young adults and not for the whole population because, again, they're all part of the same greater community. Um, and so it would have to be pretty much across the board. Uh, but we've had no such uh, intention at this point in time to mandate the flu vaccine. We'd like to think that our approach that we're taking, that is not just a messaging campaign and greater messaging and education, but greater ability to actually access the vaccine, to meet the Vermonter where they are, uh, literally, uh, to provide a reason to uh, enhance the uptake of that. Uh, will we'll get us uh, closer to the level we'd like to get. You know, traditionally, flu vaccine has less than 50% uptake across the whole population. We'd certainly want to well exceed that um, and get much higher than that. I guess just reiterate for, you know, Vermonters out there, are you, of all years, do you think this year is an acceptable time to get a vaccine? I would reiterate that this this if you if you've kind of other years said oh, I got away without it I did fine this isn't the year to say that this is the year to say all bets are off the table we've got all these viruses circulating around I'm going to at least do something about the one virus I know we have a preventive for. If I may, Governor, can I just get your reaction real quick to the President's comments earlier this week when he was asked by a reporter in the White House about the peaceful transition of power if he doesn't win the election. What were your thoughts about those comments, and were you surprised, and what went through your head with that? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't say that I was surprised, um, but I think this is dangerous rhetoric, uh, and uh, I think it further galvanized the, the divide we're seeing across the nation, where it's so polarized. I agree with uh, Governor Baker on his, uh, his response to this, and I think that there should be, as has been, happened throughout our history, a peaceful transition of power. Regardless, you know, it's tough to lose, but it needs to be to, to support our democracy. Steve? I guess staying on that, Governor, um, I haven't really ever heard uh, in at least 30 years uh, a question of whether or not we were going to have a peaceful transition of power. Is this simply just a 
buzz? You know, I, I can't pretend to know what, uh, what goes on in the president's head or what his strategy is. Um, but again, I just see this as dangerous uh, for our country. Um, it uh, further galvanized that divide that we see uh, that is happening right now, and uh, it's dangerous. Uh, people are afraid. Uh, it's just creating more confusion, more confrontation, and it's unnecessary. And um, whoever wins the election, um, and, and if it uh, goes his way, uh, there will be no transition, but we accept the results. And uh, we have to do that this time as well. Again, it's too important. Uh, and we've seen, you know, again, it's disappointing. But I think the last uh, president to lose was, uh, I believe, um, George H. W. Bush. And uh, he did so gracefully and uh, to, because he believes in our country. And if you believe in your country and you, and you, and you truly want to help people, then you allow this to happen and you do all you can to support the new president in order to support all of us. So this has been our tradition uh, and uh, we should continue to do that. And uh, just uh, as we're going into sort of a, a high tourist season uh, as well as the ski season coming up, um, the, death, uh, the death toll on Vermont roads right now is fast approaching the actual death toll of the virus right now. Um, and it seems like it's on par with, I guess, the past Last, last year being anomaly. Um, any message to folks? I mean, are we driving too fast? Are we driving just distracted? I, I'd say yes to all of the above. Um, yes, people are driving too fast. Yes, they're distracted. Uh, and it's just uh, unfortunate what we're seeing uh, across Vermont. Again, as you pointed out, last year was an abnormally good year. Um, it was about half of what, the, what we normally see in deaths on our highways. Uh, but this is uh, alarming. Uh, we seem to see uh, more than one every single week uh, at this point. And uh, people need to slow down. Um, they need to pay attention to what they're doing. Uh, because it doesn't just affect you. It's affecting someone else, an innocent victim on our highways. And uh, prevention is key. You know, whether we talk about a vaccine for the flu, or whether wearing a mask, uh, or when there's a, uh, a vaccine that's safe uh, for the coronavirus, um, we need to take those prevention uh, measures. And uh, you can do so on, on the highways. It's, it's, you're, it's literally in your hands. Mike, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor Scott, uh, First, thanks for getting Commissioner Hanford in touch with me on a struggling landlord with non-paying tenants to recover rent payments uh, or so they can pay taxes uh, to, his, to his great help. Uh, this timely question today comes from a reader of the Northeast Kingdom, actually. Apparently, the legislature has now struck from the proposed annual state budget $21,000 to fund body cameras for the Capitol Police. The reader is wondering if you could comment on the apparent irony that the state legislators want Vermont State Police to have body cameras on all troopers if the one area the cameras would be blocked in the state is where the state legislators themselves could be captured. Is this a do as I say, not as I do? Um, you know, I hadn't heard that, uh, Mike, before you brought it up, uh, and I haven't seen that part of the budget. Um, but, um, but I think it's important that we uh, cross law enforcement throughout Vermont uh, for all law enforcement to have body cameras uh, in order to protect both themselves and others. Uh, and, um, and I think it's essential. So um, again, probably a better question for them. I wasn't, uh, wasn't aware that that was happening. I know that they're finalizing the budget today. Um, so again, I don't know if it's part of it or not, but a uh, better question for them. But for the Capitol Police, from time to time, respond to incidents outside uh, the yeah. Capitol building, and, and I mean, could could the DSP uh, allocate some of their funds for body cameras? Maybe to if they would they would be within their ability to the way the budget works. Well, the, the Capitol Police uh, are sworn officers as well, um, and it is a separate organization than the State Police. I I'm not uh, at this point willing to 
to give up resources that we need uh, for our Vermont State Police uh, at this point in time to share with others. Uh, I think that uh, if the if the legislature thought it was important for the uh, State House Capitol Police uh, to have body cameras, uh, they would they would provide that uh, those resources. Uh, but uh, but they're limited, and uh, I know our budget is limited with the uh, Department of Public Safety as well, uh, Vermont State Police in general. And uh, I, I guess at this point, uh, we didn't have, uh, we're not putting any extra fluff in, in budgets, and uh, and I'm not willing to give any of that up at this point in time. If, if there's a need, sure. they should fund it. Okay. And a follow up to Steve Longcamp's uh, question uh, on the high number of fatalities. Uh, earlier this week, there was another disturbing highway safety case where two teenage drivers were driving more than 90 miles an hour at the same time on US 7 and this comes right after there was a double fatal on Route 7 just a few miles away. Your administration has a temporary directive in place ordering the state police not to release names of juvenile drivers or teen drivers in car accidents. Do you want to take it in? I'm just wondering when that directive is going to be listed and returned to the transparency that Vermonters are used to uh, and follow the Constitution. Yeah, again, I may uh, refer to Commissioner Sherling, but uh, temporary is the key word. Uh, we want to work through and make sure that we're not um, implicating or uh, altering uh, the, the case, a uh, future case, uh, as it were in regards to, uh, to naming an uh, uh, underage driver. So once we get through that, uh, we hopefully will get back to where we were before or have uh, something uh, that we can uh, we can satisfy uh, both needs. So, uh, Commissioner Sherling, anything to offer on that? Uh, just, Governor, that the uh, and answer the question, Mike. Uh, just that the assessments ongoing. Uh, our staff and the uh, staff at the, the various agencies that are uh, assessing are uh, also embroiled in. The, uh, and the legislative session which has been hectic to say the least and we still have this uh, pandemic uh, that encumbers a significant amount of time so a little slower than we'd like but we're still working on it just, just to clarify governor you, you said something about not impact cases but the last for the last 40 years there's never been an impact in any case i'm just wondering why you didn't keep with the status quo while the study or well, I, th I think I think we were yeah, yeah I mean I, I think this was brought up um, by um, the pro um, defense I believe uh, so we take that seriously um, and we don't want to uh, to impact uh, this case or other cases while we figure this out that's all um, if they hadn't brought it up we would still be doing the same thing we've been on for the last 40 years okay very good Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Pat, WCAX. Hi, my questions are likely for Holly. Any sense of how many families are still looking for child care health placements and which areas of the state do you still have the greatest need? That is a great question. Thank you. Um, we are working closely with the child care referral specialists in every community. Uh, because they are in touch with families and the local need um, and we're hearing from them where and when they start to see surges or needs in child care for the different age groups. Um, at this moment uh, we are proud to say that the areas that were identified over the last couple weeks uh, we have been able to set up hubs um, in Manchester. Uh, there's a hub in progress in Randolph. Uh, we're looking at hubs um, in Grand Isle and then also in Swanton. Uh, so we, ha we do continue to move and adapt. So our task over this coming week will be to work with the referral specialists again to see where the need still is. And as we talked about earlier, to also watch what's happening with the schools um, and whether some of them are going back to programming um, in the school in person and the hubs will shift in one direction or if in other parts of the state, if any of the schools need to perhaps shift the other way if they start to see any COVID cases and um, open up for additional remote programming. So it is a fluid and dynamic landscape uh, that we are uh, continuing to follow and work very closely with the hubs on. And the second part of your question, can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, as we, you were just talking about the areas of the state that still had um, need, I think. 
So if there's anything else to add on that subject, otherwise I'll ask my follow-up question. Okay, nope, that's great, thank you. Okay, so um, any sense broadly of the average cost of these programs for parents? Yes, so the state has put a number of measures in place to help on cost. Uh, there are uh, some hub locations that are free or very low cost to families. Uh, these are usually working in partnership with schools or with nonprofit organizations and have access to additional grants and other funding sources to help alleviate some of the cost to families. Uh, the cap that the state has put on um, the hubs is they've asked them to charge no more than um, $200 a week. Uh, for families, uh, we do have some hubs that are around $60 a day uh, when they don't have another income source to help offset the costs beyond the hub grant, which lasts uh, for the first part of the year. The other uh, measures that the state has put into place is to make sure that all of the hub locations uh, can uh, be used for the child care financial assistance program. So that is the program that helps families who quali qualify uh, afford uh, childcare um, assistance in their area. So that is in place as well. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, when these childcare hubs were discussed last month, it was said that the state capacity or what the state would need was uh, 10,000 uh, slots for these kids, and it looks like we're at a capacity of 5,000 now. Uh, did the numbers change, or did we only need half what we were looking for? I'm going back to Holly on that. Hi, thank you. So part of the difference in the numbers is the difference between children that can be served in the system and slots. So a slot may be uh, how many children on a particular day. So when we speak about 5,000 children being able to ser be served by the current network, uh, we're talking about children who may be going to hubs, most likely are going to hub more than one day a week. So one child could take up multiple slots. Uh, there may be other cases where there is a slot um, and a hub that's open five days a week and different children are filling those slots throughout the course of the week. So that's kind of the, the difference in that language. If you go back to the original press conference when the Hub Initiative was announced, uh, the state was looking at uh, being able to serve 7,300 children. That estimate came from looking at all the elementary schools in Vermont and calculating a percentage of elementary students who would need access to childcare on remote learning days. Because uh, in looking at the map, not all of our elementary schools uh, did uh, have remote learning days. We weren't um, needed to set up hubs and, and a number of school districts and supervisory unions. So it makes sense in a lot of ways that our number of 5,000 children would be lower uh, than the 7,300 that was originally estimated. So this is kind of building off what Kat was saying, but so is there a number of, like are you looking for we are very pleased and proud with where we are right now, but we're not done. So we will continue to monitor the situation. We will continue uh, to see um, what the need is in communities across the state. I think that there's, um, we need to recognize that the childcare decisions that families make are very complex and sometimes uh, it may, they may change over time. So a family that maybe didn't think it, they needed care uh, at the beginning of September, now as we're moving later into the fall, may change their mind or they may be more comfortable with sending their child to a child care hub. Uh, so we, we will keep on top of all those numbers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just uh, also want to add, Eric, um, as we see, uh, more trust and faith in the system, uh, more trust in our schools. Uh, we're also seeing more schools go back to in-person instruction. So that's good news for all of us, but it does lessen some of the pressure on the, uh, on the school programs or the hubs that we've put into place. So it's good news in some respects, uh, but, uh, but as Holly had said, uh, or, uh, going to a uh, more after school is going to be uh, necessary as well. So. Uh, it's all good for all of us. Okay, thank you. Leah, VPR. Hi, 
Hi, um, this would be a question for Dr. Levine. Um, you were talking about sort of ways to the health department looking to get the flu vaccine out to the broader population. I'm just wondering if you have specific uh, plans or or things that you're going to be doing to reach out to more vulnerable populations or frontline workers or people who've been disproportionately impacted by COVID who probably use a flu shot, uh, you know, more so than, than others. Yeah, you just covered a lot of potential uh, customers, I guess I could call them, for that. So, um, specifically, uh, many vulnerable people um, are older and reside in facilities, not necessarily nursing homes, but facilities where they have some element of their care provided. They're not totally independent. Um, we plan on actually having clinics in some of those assisted living facilities to uh, enable them to have uptake of the shot uh, when, when that's available. We also plan, as I mentioned earlier, to have some mobile capacity. So if there are vulnerable people who may have a potential disability or other issue that prevents them from accessing a more traditional site, um, we can kind of come to them which I think would be really helpful. Um, and then um, those who are in society who actually have um, socioeconomic issues or food insecurity issues um, and may have housing issues and just really can't go to where they need to go, um, we'll try to go to places where they are, whether it be to their housing facility, whether it be to a food uh, access site or what have you. Um, I, I think you're going to see just a lot of creativity around the question you asked. Um, and, you know, we've, we've partnered with many, many aspects of the healthcare system. Uh, the ideas I've given you are the ones that we know are happening, but I'm sure there are more that are yet to even uh, be known by me at this point in time um, because we've really engaged in a way that we want them to keep uh, innovating. You mentioned uh, that generally only about half the population gets the flu vaccine. I mean, do you have a, a target that you're hoping to have, like over 50 percent? What was the, the yeah? I I think is? you know it would be wonderful to have in the 60 70 percent range. Um, we've ordered vaccine in well in excess of previous years, so aspirationally we want to get there and. We want to make sure we have the vaccine available so that we can get there. So we're clearly in the over 50 percent. Um, I don't want to put a firm number on 60 or 70, but you know, in that direction would be astounding for uh, a flu season. And I, again, I just encourage people to make this that season that they say, I am going to change my behavior. And if I haven't had it in the past, I think I will get it this year. Makes sense. Um, and uh, briefly, uh, Governor Scott, are you going to be voting for Joe Biden in November? Well, we'll see. As I said before, I will not be voting for President Trump. And um, I have yet to, uh, to listen to any of the debates. Um, and I will. And to uh, see whether Vice President, former Vice President Biden will earn my vote. Uh, we'll see. I'm, you know, I'm a centrist. I'm a moderate. I want to hear some of his, his views about bringing people together and supporting some of the centrists and moderates of the world as well. Thank you. Ann Wallace-Allen, BT Digger. Uh, yeah, this is a question for um, the governor. Governor, how do you feel about the budget bill that lawmakers are going to be sending to your guests today? Do you have any issues with what you've seen so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen both uh, the Senate version, the House version. I know that they're uh, getting very close uh, to coming to a conclusion. It's in a conference uh, committee at this point in time, so I haven't seen the final bill. Uh, so it's hard to, for me to comment as to whether I had any problems because there are many last minute additions that, that could come into play here uh, that I may not be in favor of. But so far, so good. Um, they've, uh, they've brought forward a lot of the initiatives that I'd, uh, I'd asked, uh, that I'd asked to be included. Um, there are some uh, that didn't get funded 
uh, that I wanted, uh, to, but that's that's normal. Uh, that's what we do every year. Not everyone gets everything they want, um, but uh, but overall, I think it uh, the budget looks good. Uh, we're living within our means, uh, and it's something that I believe uh, Vermonters can um, can be very proud of. Are you um, satisfied with the amount of money that is going to go to help the hospitality industry? We, well, I mean, that's uh, that still can be determined. I, I think uh, there is going to have to be more resources devoted uh, to the hospitality industry. Uh, we are um, we'll work through that uh, through the uh, Joint Fiscal Committee as well uh, in the aftermath of the budget, uh, because there will be some money still left over from the coronavirus relief funds uh, and uh, and the CARES money uh, that we will be able to to uh, tap into uh, in the aftermath of the budget. So we'll continue to work on that. But I, I still believe that uh, there needs to be more economic relief for the hospitality industry in particular. Um, okay, and um, this is a question for Mr. Mike Harrington, if he's on the line. Um, did the people who were, who were getting the $600 federal Unemployment supplement. Um, are they still going to be eligible? Are all those people going to be eligible for the $300 supplement that's coming their way? I think Mike uh, may be on, but I think the, the quick answer is the majority of them would be. Um, but there were some uh, guidelines uh, put in place, uh, provisions. Uh, you had to make at least uh, $100, and uh, there may have been a couple of other provisions that where not everyone would be included, but the vast majority of them uh, would be. Uh, Commissioner Harrington? You're absolutely correct, Governor. Um, the two provisions that were unique to the LWA program or the $300 program were that people had to have a weekly benefit amount of $100 or more. Uh, in the FPUC program, as long as you were uh, receiving any benefit amount um, you were eligible for the $600. Uh, likewise, um, specific to the LWA program, um, you specifically have to be unemployed um, due to a uh, COVID reason or your employment must be disrupted due to COVID. And that wasn't the case with the 600? That's correct. Um, and there's another uh, there's another sum of money, I don't know what it is, that is, headed, that is going to be used for another batch of $300 payments, right? That's in the budget now, like in the House version, I think. I don't think there's a, it's in the House version or any of the budget. I think those are separate. These are federal dollars. There was an extra, it was three weeks to begin know. with, and then there's a second uh, tier of another three weeks, I believe. Is that correct, Commissioner Harrington? <coughs> That's correct, and, and what you may be referring to, Anne, is um, the, the provision that was discussed about um, adding an additional $100 benefit on top of the $300, and I do know that that was discussed uh, last night um, as part of the budget. Um, I don't know where it ended up, but uh, it was to the tune of about $17 million to provide additional benefits on top of the LWA benefit. Um, so, I, again, the governor's correct. We don't want to mix up the, the difference in the federal program, which is the, the $300 per week for a total of six weeks. Uh, and then uh, we had also looked for um, additional CRF money to be allocated um, to provide an additional $100 um, for potentially up to four weeks, but it really just depends on how much money uh, the legislature, um, if at all, puts aside for that program. Okay. Thank you so much. Wilson, the AP. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I guess this is a question for Secretary French, although anyone else could weigh in if they'd like. Um, with the state ready to move into uh, step three in the education plan, what comes next, assuming things continue to go well on the virus front, and how far can that be taken before there is widespread vaccination, which presumably wouldn't be happening mid-year mid, mid next year or later? How far can it go? Secretary French. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> 
Well, as I mentioned, we're, we're certainly trying to think about the future and, and plan accordingly. Um, you know, we're, we're listening very closely uh, to the, the conversation around the vaccine. Um, I think, you know, it's important to consider our mitigation strategies as sort of being layers. Uh, the foundational layer, of course, is uh, what we've achieved. All Vermonters have helped us achieve in terms of having a high degree of suppression of the virus. And then the other layers, such as you know, wearing a mask and so forth, um, are enacted in our school guidance um, to ensure uh, safety. So I think you know we think about a vaccine as being yet another layer uh, in, in the mitigation strategies. Um, and certainly uh, we expect in the school situation to be operating with all these layers uh, for some time until the full impact of the vaccine is achieved. But I, as I mentioned, I think you know our, our efforts right now appropriately were one on reopening schools, but then the next next uh, piece of work for us is to begin to address uh, the impact of the emergency on student learning um, and pointing the education system to do that work with an understanding that we'll probably be in this extended period uh, with mitigation strategies for some time. So, so there is no step four? Not in our original guidance, no. Um, you know, we, we basically crafted two, two levels, if you will, of our mitigation strategies. Um, as I mentioned, we, we do uh, plan to update our uh, plan every month, um, but at this point we don't contemplate additional levels uh, or steps. Uh, okay, great. Thank you very much. Aaron, VT Digger. Um, Governor Scott, how would you grade your performance at the debate last night? I, I didn't have a debate last night. I was on actually in the morning, um, but I uh, okay, I haven't sorry. I haven't watched it. I think that's for the general public to decide, not me. Any additional thoughts? I think it's a, I think it's above a D plus. Uh, that's what I got from the NEA before, but I think it was above that. Any other thoughts about how the debate went? Um, no, no, I think it was, uh, I think the questions were expected. Um, no, no other thoughts really. Okay. Um, I also have a question uh, probably for Dr. Levine about uh, this week's uh, Department of Health report, which reports that um, Presumably, of the you know reported COVID-19 cases, about 23% have been asymptomatic. Does that fall in line with data that we've seen outside of Vermont? And you know, do you believe it to be representative of um, how many people are, are asymptomatic of COVID-19 in general? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a great question. Um, you know, if you parse out the number. Um, it turns out to be obviously a much larger number when you're looking at the pediatric population. And some of our evidence when we looked at <coughs> uh, the BIPOC population is that um, they are sometimes um, more likely to be symptomatic. But I think if you look at it in the grand picture, we only know who's symptomatic or not symptomatic if they've been documented as a case. And with the, the growing belief in the propensity of this virus to infect people and the people don't know they're infected because they either don't develop severe symptoms or they have no symptoms, I suspect uh, the number of asymptomatic people who have ever had contact with COVID is much higher than in the 20% range, probably higher than 40% even. Um, we just don't know that, um, and it's a challenge. If I look at the antibody data, we don't believe very many Vermonters have been exposed to the virus at all, uh, but when you go to look at antibody data in places that have had uh, huge experience with the virus, the numbers do get higher. So I'm, I'm not giving you a definitive answer except to say that the number is probably higher than what we've reported. It's just we don't have an idea of how many people have had contact with the virus in total. Thank you. Um, Dr. Levine, I'm going to 
Does the, does the asymptomatic rate tell you anything about our testing protocols and whether they're potentially reaching asymptomatic people? Um, yeah, it does. You know, some, some, yeah. <laughs> so, like, you know, the, 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 the largest percentage of people who are asymptomatic, who should test positive, would be people who have said they've been in contact with someone with COVID. And early on in the pandemic, about 10 or more percent would test positive eventually. Now, when we test that population, it's really under 5% which sometimes sounds very surprising. That people who actually say, I was in contact with someone with COVID or who are contact tracers have identified as a contact and say, you need to be quarantined because you had the degree of contact with someone with COVID that could put you at risk and then put others at risk, turns out to be now 5% uh, or less, which to me is a, a pretty startling number uh, to say the least. The only other population we have experience with is those who have traveled and want to try to get a day seven test to get out of quarantine. And again, um, many, many of those are able to get out of quarantine. Um, but again, just because they came from a zone that was redder or yellower than Vermont uh, doesn't mean they themselves were in contact with people who would put them at risk. Uh, but many of them are successful. So it's a really hard number to get a handle on without literally testing everybody in the population at some point in time, uh, which, you know, hasn't happened uh, at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Uh, good morning. Uh, Governor, uh, echoing your or amplifying your comments earlier about the legislature and adjournment, uh, I mean, how involved has the administration been in some of these big bills that are moving this week? Uh, you seem to be generally okay with the, the construct of the budget agreement, but you know, do we need a use of force policy, or is there anything else that's headed your way that you don't think you can accept? Well, we have concerns. Uh, Commissioner Sherling has outlined a lot of the concerns we have with the uh, excessive force bill that's uh, heading, appears to be heading our way. I don't think it's passed completely yet. We had a path forward on that as well. Uh, we'll see uh, where we go. Uh, I don't, uh, I haven't made any decisions on any of the bills uh, that are coming uh, my way as to whether to let them go or not. But um, but that was one, one bill we had concerns about. And we'll see what happens, you know, in the late stages of any legislative session, um, it, 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 anything can happen. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll know a lot more, uh, hopefully tonight or tomorrow, or whenever they adjourn, and uh, then make a determination as to what, uh, what finally passed and what didn't. Uh, I'm, right. I'm, very, I'm very concerned, uh, by the way, uh, about the, the lack of uh, the Act 250 uh, bill. Uh, being moved forward. I'm not sure uh, if that's going to be taken up today or not. A lot of work was put into that over the last couple of years, um, and, uh, and it, it's unfortunate uh, because uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, different entities uh, working together. Uh, again, over these last two years, put a lot of work into this, and I think it's essential uh, as we move forward to try and grow this economy uh, that we update Act 250. All right, uh, and just to, to clarify something you said earlier about Governor Baker and the dust up, President Trump's gone after him this morning, calling him a Republican in name only. But the uh, New York Times this morning quotes the chair of your Vermont Republican Party as saying the president's right to question the integrity of the election, that everyone knows the checklists are, you know, in question. Uh, is the chair of your party, the Vermont party, complicit in a disinformation effort? Well, she's obviously entitled uh, to her opinion. Uh, I've stated mine. I believe that um, we need to have a path forward. Uh, we need people to vote. Uh, we have uh, uh, ballots that are being mailed to every Vermonter, and I would encourage uh, Vermonters to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, I think there's been 
you know, a lot of apathy over the years. In my uh, in the last 20 years, I've been part of um, part of this uh, political process, and um, sometimes those who complain the most uh, don't always vote. And I would say, now's your chance. Uh, there's no really. The Secretary of State said it. There's no excuse for not voting this year. You're going to be mailed a ballot, and so exercise your right and vote. If you if you don't agree with the direction we're going in right now. Uh, take advantage of that, uh, or if you if you accept and 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 uh, want to continue the way we're going, take advantage of that as well. This is your opportunity. Thanks, Steve. Nek TV. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, thanks. Um, regarding the flu shot. Um, for uh, 19 years, the CDC has been testing, well, the CDC now tests about 600,000 swabs from patients with flu-like symptoms for an average of about 15% positive rate for influenza, which the flu shots are made for, showing that 85% of people are sick from some other virus, and coronavirus is being about 40%. And there are 36 known coronaviruses, um, four of them routinely cause 40% of the illnesses year after year. Three are labeled as pandemic. But according to the CDC, the flu vaccines reduce the risk by 40 to 60% when they are well matched um, to the flu. When they're not well matched, they have little to no benefit. And they report that about 30, they cap uh, 30,000 vaccine injury reports a year, which is a capture rate of about 1% of all adverse effects. Uh, and most of the adverse effects of that 1% are mild, but um, 10 to 15% include permanent disability, hospitalization, life threatening illness, or death. And, um, uh, and because the vaccine courts, uh, according to the PrEP Act, uh, the vaccine makers are immune from liability, and a plaintiff has to uh, prove willful misconduct, and the court cases are held in private, um, aren't, uh, aren't there uh, risks associated uh, with, with flu vaccines? Well, you have me uh, totally confused at this point, Steve, but uh, I'm going to go way out on a limb and assume this is a question for Dr. Levine. Yeah, I don't, I don't have uh, all my statistics in front of me now, Steve, but you've done a good job with uh, throwing a lot of numbers around and at us. Uh, I do know, uh, even when you're saying the percentage of the adverse uh, events that are more serious, uh, you're giving a, a percent number. I do know that in any given flu season, that's a very, very small number of absolute people considering the number of doses of flu vaccine that are administered. The um, reality is that um, the notion of who's liable, how to prosecute that, who's immune, from uh, litigation, et cetera, is way beyond uh, the state of Vermont um, at this point in time. And it's going to be hard for me to comment on any of that. Um, the thing I want to comment on the most is that you may have just created uh, fear in the hearts of many people who actually were thinking they might go get the flu vaccine. And I invite well, them. My no, I understand. Uh, unanticipated consequence. So I just want to make sure that people understand that the percentage of people who have any kind of an adverse reaction to anything uh, is generally very, very small. And with the flu vaccine, um, in recent years, um, the data does not show that people are being harmed by having gotten the flu vaccine. 
You're correct on the other hand that sometimes they're not always being helped to the degree we want, depending on the match of the vaccine to the strains of the virus that are circulating. Um, but certainly uh, on a good year, we expect around 60% or so to be um, of, of an efficacy rate. Um, and there was a few years ago a year that just wasn't as good. So uh, not as much protection came from that vaccine. Although still people, even if they didn't avoid getting the flu, would have had a milder uh, illness from it. Okay, and uh, a quick political question for the governor, seeing as there were some thrown around earlier. Uh, the governor, there was a report out of the Senate um, recently um, about uh, Joe Biden's lifelong uh, dealings that have enriched his brothers and his family and specifically his son um, uh, while he was while he was in office. Do you have any uh, do you have any comment on uh, people enriching their family while they're uh, through their official uh, official titles and uh, stuff like that? Yeah, I'm and I'm assuming you're talking about the U.S. Senate, not the Vermont Senate, although they could yes, have sir, as well. Um, I'm I'm opposed to it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Joe Lee, Local 22. Hi, uh, this is a question for Secretary French. Um, regarding step three, um, now that it gives uh, schools the ability to reopen cafeterias and gyms, um, what's the status of um, reopening uh, school buses and transportation services? Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, we, um, when we opened schools, uh, we opened up step two, except for transportation, which we did open in step three to begin with. Uh, so we've been at step three for school transportation since the very beginning, uh, largely because of the logistical challenges of uh, delivering school transportation, particularly in our more rural areas of the state. So we've been at step three for transportation from the very beginning. I see. Um, you also mentioned um, revisions earlier on, and I just want to know what's being done um, to address uh, the misuse of temperature guns. Um, they seem to be accessible um, technology, but also uh, easy to misuse. Um, is that in your revision plan? Oh, the mission, we are going to uh, address uh, some, some aspect of that relative to the cold temperature. So uh, there's been some debate uh, in the scientific community as well about the efficacy of temperature checks. Uh, I know our, our scientists uh, still strongly support their use. Um, but our task force will be reconvened um, and we'll, we'll be looking at temperature checks we're, we're primarily as a function of the cold weather, um, but we'll be reviewing a number of items, I'm sure, uh, that will affect the use of temperature checks in the coming weeks. And just a quick uh, clarification, um, step three allows for um, sports uh, to meet, but um, does it also allow um, travel activities in general? Um, uh, I'm not sure if I understand uh, travel activities relative to school. Yeah, relative to school, like clubs that also travel, or is it just specific uh -oh. to sports? Yeah, the specific connection to sports is about interscholastic competitions. It, it, is, it certainly assumes a certain amount of travel, uh, but our overall guidance does speak to the issue of field trips and so forth. Um, you know, certainly um, the general disposition is to encourage schools to think, you know, think twice essentially before holding those types of activities. Um, I will say in addition, uh, relative to this idea of making revisions to our guidance, one of the issues uh, that has come up is a need um, expressed from school districts to get more guidance on the issue of extracurricular activity other than sports. So I think that's one of the issues we will probably address in the forthcoming uh, revision. All righty, thank you very much. Andrew, Caledonian Records. Yes, good afternoon. Um, uh, I guess to continue with Secretary French, um, uh, Julie just touched on some of it. Uh, I'm just curious if there were other um, aspects of the guidance that were you were thinking were right for uh, review at this point, um, especially anything during the, the, the 
conduct of the school day, whether it be spacing or masks or potting, things of that nature that would have a direct impact on them on a classroom experience, if you will. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think so. I think basically just the revisit the process is that what we do is in the task force, which is rather large, we bring together um, the health and science experts also with some practitioners. Uh, so it's really about bringing those two sides of the equation together. And as we've done, I think, in all our guidance in the state, we really put some emphasis, a great deal of emphasis on the science piece. Um, but that needs to be informed to a certain extent uh, based on practice. Uh, so we're constantly, as I mentioned earlier, creating these FAQ documents which are largely based from a practice standpoint as, as questions emerge from the very practical implementation of the guidance. And we want to get that feedback captured back in the guidance. Uh, at the same time, um, we, we put a significant emphasis on the health information. So um, we're, we, we've accumulated a number of items from the practice standpoint. Uh, certainly a part of the revision process will be to first uh, understand if there's anything new uh, emerging from a science uh, perspective that should be incorporated in the guidance. But I would just say stay tuned. Uh, once again, we plan to do this every month. Um, and I expect uh, we'll publish a revision, revision of the guidance at some point here in October. Uh, and this might be for uh, Commissioner Levine. Um, I saw a headline the other day from elsewhere in the country on, uh, on people uh, with positive COVID tests knowingly violating uh, quarantine requirements, including um, parents sending kids to school. Um, has Vermont experienced anything uh, like that? People, you know, close contacts, skipping quarantine, or, or people out and about with known cases? That's a great question because uh, there are going to be times where we're actually not aware of that because most of those people aren't going to want it to be public that they are violating their quarantine. Um, we're not aware of a lot of poor cooperation, however, and our contact tracing team you know, makes the initial contacts. Um, they then utilize the Sarah Alert app which is not a tracking app. It doesn't tell them that the person is now uh, attending some big function, even though they're supposed to be in quarantine. But it does allow communication back and forth as needed. And then at the end of it all, there can be more communication about resolution of symptoms and feeling fine, uh, rather than just having us make the assumption 30 days later that people resolved. So. Um, you know, we're not getting uh, huge reports. I assume the way we'd get these reports would be other members of our society who say, aren't you supposed to be in quarantine and you're not, uh, and reporting them, so to speak. Uh, and we're just not hearing a lot of that happening. Um, and we actually, you know, when, when we have a setting we're dealing with, if it's a work setting, if it's a school setting, for instance, uh, or a long-term care facility or correctional facility, we know if those people have actually come back to work, as does their employer, and the last thing their employer wants them to be doing the majority of the time is showing up when they shouldn't show up. So uh, we're not getting a lot of notifications that say the opposite. So I, I feel pretty good about that. I know the story you were talking about. Um, I'm, I'd love to say Vermonters are above that, um, but nothing to worry us with yet. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello, I was looking at uh, the job report from last week, and I'm sure it has not escaped your notice that um, the, the what looks like a very favorable headline unemployment rate for the state is actually based on a very large drop uh, in the number of people in the labor force. And uh, that was obviously a problem before COVID. Um, do you have any sense of the cause of the current drop? Um, is it something that you think we're going to have to dig our way out of, or do you think people will come back to work when um, more jobs are available? Um, first of all, Joe, I think the, the I feel, uh, we feel, uh, the formula is skewed in some respects. 
uh, and doesn't provide the accurate information that we need. Now, it's the same as it always has been, uh, but these are unusual times, and people answer differently uh, based on their situation. So, um, but I do uh, believe uh, two things. One, uh, when we finally get through all of this, uh, that we are still going to have workforce challenges in the state. We still desperately need more people to come live in our state and bring their kids with them um, and, uh, and to provide for the workforce. Because as you remember, we're, we're pre-pandemic, uh, we had the lowest unemployment rate in the country and uh, we had more jobs uh, than we had people to fill. Uh, so um, I expect we'll get back to that and we'll have to face uh, those challenges uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the coming year. Um, I would also expect uh, that we will see uh, those who are uh, unemployed at this point or have lost their jobs or uh, they're, they're, uh, they've been shut down uh, and the jobs aren't uh, open at this point, uh, they will resume. Um, and if we can keep particularly the hospitality sector um, in survival mode, uh, then they can thrive afterwards. Uh, but it's going to take us, uh, I think, making more investments in the hospitality sector for that to happen. Uh, but uh, I think we will get back to some sort of normal, but we're going to have to provide assistance along the way. Thank you, Governor. Um, just one follow-up. You said that you thought that the figures were skewed. Um, could you elaborate and explain you know, why you think that and how they're skewed? Yeah, it's, you know, I think it's, uh, I'll let Commissioner Harrington uh, answer this because he does it more eloquently than I do. Um, but uh, it's based on how they uh, receive the information. Um, and, uh, and I believe it's on a survey and, and how the question's asked. And so it might lead uh, some uh, to answer differently than, than and it's not, uh, it's not that they're being dishonest, it's just that the way the, the question is being portrayed, uh, they might answer it different than, than the actual situation they're in. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, can you uh, give us a, a brief, um, maybe explanation from your perspective? Sure, uh, and you are correct, Governor. And, and I, um, you know, when we're talking about the survey, um, it's actually a, a national survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, it has standard questions that are asked uh, week over week or month over month and they those questions don't change due to the what's happening in the world around us and so what we are running into right now is a, a definitional issue in terms of what is considered the labor force and what is considered unemployed and so um, as part of the household survey conducted by the census bureau the way they determine the unemployment rate is based on the number of people that they survey and of those people surveyed, how many are actively looking for work or have looked for work in the past four weeks and how many of those people would accept work if offered. And we all know, um, you know that there are a number of mitigating factors right now during COVID that prevent someone from looking for work or being able to accept work but the survey doesn't differentiate in that number. And so when we're looking at an unemployment rate, if we're basing it solely on those people who are actively looking for work and able to accept work, that's how we get the 4.8%. But in, in all actuality, if we look at the number of people who are still filing for benefits, uh, that number is probably more somewhere between 8 and 10% unemployment. It's just not um, in alignment with how the federal government um, calculates the unemployment rate. Uh, and so um, I, to that effect, I wouldn't look at those numbers and simply say that, um, you know, we've lost 15,000 people out of our labor force. Uh, and because there's a low unemployment rate, those people must have gone back to work. Um, you know, our labor force, I don't think, has, has changed much. Um, it's just that we have, again, a high number of people collecting unemployment. And right now, um, you know, whether it's because we're not requiring them to search for work or because they have an underlying uh, COVID qualifying um, issue that is preventing them from looking for work, um, that's really what's leading to this, um, the difference in these numbers. 
So the federal government's attempt to be consistent in the way they ask questions is in this case producing uh, the opposite of what they intend. Um, is, that, is that what I'm to understand? Correct, and I believe this is an issue that many states have uh, brought forth to both uh, the U.S. Department of Labor as well as the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Bureau. Um, and at this time, they've chosen uh, consistency over accuracy. Uh, and, and part of that I, I, I'm completely sympathetic to because it allows us to look back historically. And when you start changing questions, um, you can't do that. However, um, I think we should also take these numbers with somewhat of a grain of salt because I'm not sure they're truly reflective of the current conditions in the state. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Greg, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I want to ask a quick follow-up in regards to my Congress question on uh, if we not releasing names um, when and if that uh, uh, is lifted, will the state police be going back through and releasing the names of uh, those involved in incidents that have previously been uh, held with help? Yeah, I would assume so, Greg. Um, you know, we were we were fine with what we were doing uh, previous to this incident, um, but we wanted to be cautious and take a step back. Uh, and make sure that we were uh, within the law in doing so. So uh, we have, um, I, I, yeah, if we if we went back uh, to the way uh, we did things before, uh, we would release the names. Okay, and, and that would be for the ones that have uh, been withheld in this time period? Yeah, if, we, if it was proven uh, that we were doing things appropriately, uh, yes, we would release the names. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, I heard this morning that uh, Slugger's Notch, the, uh, the, the portalettes are still in place instead of the uh, restrooms that the state has up in the notch. Uh, is, is that COVID related? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I, would, uh, I would assume uh, that it's COVID related. I would also assume uh, this time of year uh, with the uh, foliage starting and again they may have been there all year long I just don't know uh, but that we may uh, ramp up and bring uh, some of those uh, portable devices in uh, to uh, to take care of the, uh, the traveling public and those who are coming to to experience the beauty of Vermont yeah I think that that's why I bring up uh, with foliage season starting it appears that the uh, composting toilets that are that are there that the state has, has invested in uh, are closed to the public. That, that, that we have four lets. Um and I'm just curious uh, why that might be and, and why that might be a safer alternative than the, the composting toilets. Yeah, I just don't know. I'd be happy to uh, take a look at that, and uh, it's probably out of the uh, parks department, but uh, and or maybe it's V Trans. I just don't know. Um, but we'll get to the bottom of it. Okay. Thank you. This is Secretary Moran. I think maybe oh, great. for a moment, if you'd like. Thank you. I didn't sure. care. Uh, yeah, so through, through the, the CARES Act funding, the agency did uh, receive a significant appropriation, almost $2 million, to improve um, sanitization at, at state lands, and that included um, installation of portalettes at a number of facilities. Um, portalettes are, are far easier to sanitize and maintain than some of our traditional structures that have significant wood surfaces. Um, and so we have really um, prioritized the use of those facilities this season in order to keep up with, with CDC recommendations regarding um, cleaning and, and sanitizing. How often are those sanitized? And uh, you know, I, I'm curious if, if they're sanitized more often than uh, you know the, the CDC estimates of this virus lasts on wood, for example. Uh, I would need to, to check into that and get back to you. Um, it, it depends on the terms of the contract. I know when we issued the contract, we specifically sought vendors that would be able to provide 
um, maintenance at the recommended frequency. I also know that some of the contractors um, indicated they weren't able to do that, and so we, we've tried to, to maximize the amount of maintenance that those facilities receive. Um, but I can't say what, what, those, what those specific um, uh, units of the smugglers not are seeing in terms of maintenance. Okay. I guess I will follow up with you another time on that. Thank you for your time, Governor. Have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, just a couple of quick things. I have a larger question about broadband. Um, and uh, from Michael Harrington, maybe. Is, are those $300 checks, those, those all gone out? I'm wondering because if people haven't got them on their uh, should not expect them at this point. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, not all of them have gone out, but that is because we're doing uh, rolling payments that people certify. Um, so uh, a series of checks went out uh, last week and were received this week. Another series of checks went out this week. Uh, at this time, we're still talking about the first um, series of three weeks. Uh, and uh, we've received approval from the federal government uh, for the second three weeks and are simply waiting on the, on the funds to be allocated to us. Um, so those will start as well in the coming weeks. So um, it's not necessarily that if someone hasn't received a check yet that they're not going to receive a check. Um, if they did certify, it may just be that um, they certified after we um, sent out the first uh, round of checks. And, so we'll, again, we're, we're doing rolling payments um, as people certify that their reason for unemployment is um, due to COVID. All right, great, thank you. And Governor, for the, the moratorium on disconnects, I, I saw, and I believe I have this right, the PUC extended the moratorium until October 15th, but that, I thought that was something that, that you did through your executive orders. Um. We did the disconnects. I mean, we did um, the evictions. I'm not sure about the disconnects, to be honest with you. Uh, I can uh, I can check with uh, with our commissioner, uh, Commissioner Tierney, and uh, and find out for sure. But uh, but I know we did the foreclosures and evictions. Uh, but I'm not sure if we had any language in terms of disconnects. Okay. All right. So they said it. We'll take a we'll take a look though and get back to you, Tim. Okay. And as far as broadband is concerned, you know, beyond uh, the pressure being put on by distance learning in the public schools and elsewhere, there's a lot of people, at least temporarily, looking to move into Vermont or at least get a second home in Vermont. And uh, having a better a better broadband system would obviously uh, enhance that that opportunity to take advantage of those people coming here. What I know there's been CARES Act. Um, money at least temporarily put into the expanding the system. But if you have a, a broader uh, broader plan of, um, to expand or um, take advantage of this opportunity? Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, we we started uh, with some of that uh, with pre-pandemic, um, some of the uh, community uh, utility uh, departments that were being established, we've enhanced those with uh, some of the CARES money. Um, but we have to keep in mind as well, um, even if we had more CARES money available at this point, we have the uh, uh, December 31st deadline uh, that it has to be uh, utilized and uh, put into place. So uh, I believe we've done all we can in terms of broadband under the current guidelines. If there was more flexibility, that might make a difference. Uh, I'm going to continue uh, to have my conversations with the congressional delegation, uh, Senator Leahy and Senator Sanders and Congressman Welch, and I, and I know we're all on the same page. Um, this is something that we've, uh, we knew it was a problem before. Uh, we knew that, uh, that it was something that uh, would be uh, economically uh, attractive uh, for many in the state, uh, and, uh, but it was very expensive. Uh, we're, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and we're not alone. Uh, there are a number of other rural states uh, that are in the same predicament as Vermont. Uh, and that's why I think there needs to be more of an REA approach to this. I think it needs congressional action. Um, and, uh, and I think that there needs to be funding uh, throughout the country on this because, again, this pandemic has highlighted the need 
uh, and uh, now we just need the resources in order to fulfill the need. And so we'll continue to work with them, uh, and hopefully instead of the Rural uh, Electrification Act, uh, it will be the uh, Rural uh, Broadband Act, and uh, we'll be able to assist uh, Vermont in getting into the 21st century. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll be back on Tuesday, and we'll have modeling again on Tuesday. Thank you.